All right, so we're going to work through section 1.3 today, which is transformations of functions. This should be a review from way back in Algebra 2. So we're going to look at how we do vertical and horizontal shifts, and then we're going to look at how we do vertical and horizontal stretching. All right, so for the first thing for vertical and horizontal shifts, if you are adding something to your problem outside of the original function, that tells us that we're going to move it up on our y-axis. If you're subtracting something outside of your original function, that means you're going to move it down on your y-axis. If it's inside your function you're subtracting, you move it to the right. That how many units? And if it's inside your function you're adding, you move it to the left, so backwards however many units. Okay, and then we're going to look at stretching and reflecting graphs. All right, so if I'm multiplying my function by some constant, then that tells you that I'm going to stretch it vertically by that factor, so it's going to get skinnier. If I'm multiplying it by a fraction, then I'm going to shrink it vertically, so it's going to get wider. If I'm multiplying inside my function, then that shrinks it horizontally. And if I'm dividing it by some inside my function by some constant, then I'm going to stretch it horizontally. If I multiply my whole function by a negative, then that reflects it over the x-axis. And if I just take my x factor inside my function by a negative, that reflects it on the y-axis. All right, so we're going to look at actually sketching some different transformations. 
So an example, I'm given the function, the square root of x, I'm given the graph for that function, and I'm asked to graph those five different transformations of that function. All right, so if I start with y equals the square root of x minus 2, this minus 2 is outside of my original function, meaning it's not under my square root. So that tells me that I'm going to be moving it down to on my y-axis, down because of the minus. So each of these original points just goes down 2 for my original graph, and that gives me the square root of x minus 2. I look at the second part, y equals the square root of x minus 2, where the minus 2 is inside my original function because it's under my square root. Well, if I'm subtracting 2 inside my function, I'm moving to the left or to the right. To the right. Okay, so I'm going to move to the right. So that tells me that I'm going to move each of these dots to the right two spots. So my blue graph is the square root of x minus 2. Everything just moved to the right, 2. All right, if I look at negative square root of x, since I'm taking the, making the whole function negative, is that going to reflect over my x-axis or my y-axis? The x-axis, yep. So then this function just flips upside down. So that point stays the same. That one comes down, and this one comes down too. And I get negative square root of x. For y equals 2 square root of x, that just tells me that I'm multiplying everything by a factor of 2. So 0 times 2 is stays 0. 1 times 2 goes up to 2, so I know I'm going to go up 2 instead of going up 1. And 2 times 2 changes to 4, so I know I'm going to go up 4. So that stretches my graph vertically. All right, and then lastly, y equals negative square root of x, where I'm making, or square root of negative x, where I'm making my x negative. What axis do I reflect that over? X or y? Y, okay, so. Then just each of these points gets reflected over y, so instead of going over one, up one, I'm going back one, up one, and back four, up two. So that would be the graph squared in negative x. Does that make sense? So the same can be said for trig functions. So if I'm given the graph sine of x, I want to give sine of 2x and 1 sine or y equals 1 minus sine of x. The sine of 2x tells me that I'm shrinking my graph by a factor of 2. So each of these points is only halfway in between each of the other ones. So it gets a lot skinnier. What does 1 minus sine of x tell us to do? Starting with the 1, what does the positive 1 tell us to do? Because I can rewrite this negative sine of x plus 1. So what does the plus 1 tell me to do? 
go up one, okay? And what is this negative in front of the sine of x tell me to do? So I'm going to reflect on which axis. Reflect over x-axis. Okay, so it tells me that these points, I'm going to reflect them. Well, if I reflect 0, 0 just stays 0, and then I'm going to go up 1. If I reflect this when it comes down, but then it goes up 1. If I reflect this point, it stays where it's at, but then it goes up 1. This point, if I reflect it, it comes up here, but then I go up 1. This point stays where it's at, except it goes up 1. If I reflect this one, it comes down to negative 1, and then I move it up 1, etc. So, negative sine of x plus 1 looks like that green graph where everything just went up 1 and then gets flipped upside down. Okay, so it doesn't matter which graph you're doing. Any graph, those are the same types of reflections. The second thing that we're going to look at is composite functions. And a composite function is just when you're putting two functions together. Alright, so f plus g of x, if you're asked to find f plus g of x, that just tells you to add your function, so f of x plus g of x. f minus g of x tells you to subtract them, so f of x minus g of x. f times g of x tells you to multiply your two functions together, f of x times g of x. And f divided by g of x tells you to divide your functions, f of x divided by g of x. And then this little composite symbol which is an open, like, multiplication sign, little tiny circle, tells you to put your functions together, so f composite g of x is f of g of x. Okay. So if I'm given two functions, f of x equals the square root of x, and g of x equals the square root of 2 minus x, and I'm asked to find f composite g of x. Well, that just tells me to find f of g of x, which tells me that anywhere I see an x in my original function, I'm going to put the whole function g of x. So for f of x, the only x is right underneath the square root sign, but instead I'm going to put the square root of 2 minus x into that function. And the square root and the square root becomes a fourth root. Because 2 times 2 is 4. So this becomes the fourth root of 2 minus x. I do the same thing for g composite f of x. That's like g of f of x, which tells me that anywhere I see an x in my g function, I'm going to put in f of x. So the square root of 2 minus, and x is the or f of x is the square root of x. And you can't simplify that one, so just 2 minus the square root of 2 minus the square root of x. So I want to find f composite f of x. That's like f of f 
of x. So that tells me I'm going to put f of x in for my, any of my x's in my original function. So square root of x becomes square root of square root of x. Again, 2 times 2 is 4, so this just becomes the fourth root of x. And g composite g of x tells me g of g of x. So square root of 2 minus the square root of 2 minus x. And you can simplify g. All right. And then sometimes you're asked to find composites of more than two functions, so like three functions. So if I'm given f of x equals x divided by x plus 1, g of x equals x to the tenth, and h of x equals x plus 3, I want to find f composite g composite h. So I can rewrite this f of g of h of x, which tells me that h of x is going in for x in g of x, and g of x is going in for x in f of x. So let's start with just finding g of h of x. Well, g of x is x to the tenth, but instead of being x, it's now x plus 3, because that's what h of x is. So g composite h is x plus 3 to the tenth power. And then the second part of that tells me to put that whole thing in for f. So f of x plus 3 to the tenth tells me that I'm going to put x plus 3 to the tenth and everywhere I see an x. So x plus 3 to the tenth on top, x plus 3 to the tenth on bottom, plus you still have that plus 1 in f of x. So the key to working multiple composites is to work from the inside out. All right, so we're going to work on 42, 1 through 5, 8 through 24, 31 through 40.